Well, hey everyone, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a student of the Bible. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 22 years and I'm a writer and you can find the stuff that I write on my website, uh, samberg.org. Um, the blog there says posts, click on that. And I have a bunch of things I've written over the years. Um, I would say that my more recent writings are better. <laughs> Some of my older writings, uh, yeah, we're just gonna kind of, we, we all did things when we were younger that we wish we wouldn't have. I'm just gonna say that. Um, and wrote things that we wish we wouldn't have. Uh, all right, b before we get to James chapter one, I wanted to kind of um, just show you something. I picked this book up at the library two days ago. It's called Reading Genesis. Sorry about the book. I don't know if you see that really well. There you go. By Marilyn Robinson. Um, Marilyn Robinson is a, uh, like a fictional author and she's a great writer. Um, and she decided she wanted to write a book about reading the book of Genesis and um, kind of interacting with some of the ancient Mesopotamian literature. She talks about the Epic of Gilgamesh and um, some other things in here. And uh, I think it's really fascinating. Um, now, you have to understand she's not a Bible scholar. In fact, a lot of times she mentions biblical scholarship and then bucks right against it. So if you are someone who's like, really looking for the biblical scholarly positions on things she might be kind of against that but i do love the way she writes it's very beautiful i'm about mm, the, the book is like th uh, three-fourths of the book is her you know reading the genesis and then the other th the other uh quarter of the book is genesis in the kjv so um i'm about a quarter of the way through um the beginning part of it and it, it's just it's really fascinating it's um, it's kind of like a different take um, than the biblical scholarly positions and a way different take than the traditional positions, but kind of right down the middle kind of a deal. Um, so if you're into that, I, this came out in 2024, so um, I would I'd suggest reading through it. It's a lot. It's actually, actually been pretty fun to read through. All right, James chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 19. A couple things we need to know. There's not a lot in here that um, we're going to have to go to the Greek to kind of figure out. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing that we have to be clear on, though, this entire section, 19 to 27, um, is going to be about this idea of the implanted word within you, okay, and what to do with it. When James writes, and, and it, all, most of the time in the New Testament, when the New Testament authors use the word, the word of God or word or whatever, they're not talking about the Bible. We just need to clear that up. Okay, the Bible did not, the way we have it, did not exist um, when they wrote this. So they wouldn't have had anything to reference with that. Um, and especially James. When, uh, you know, as I, as I look at it and as I see it, James, as he's living and writing, is not writing uh, or living even when other New Testament stuff is even written. As we said at the beginning of this series, um, a lot of scholars believe that James was one of the first books that was written in the New Testament. So if that's the case, he's not talking about the Bible. And when the New Testament authors reference the scriptures, or reference the Hebrew Bible, they call it the graphe, they call it the law and the prophets, they call it the law and the prophets, the writings. They don't call it the word of God. Anytime in the New Testament that you see the, this phrase, the word of God, more often than not, it's referring to one of two things. It's either referring to the prophetic word that's being spoken, or it's referring to the gospel of Jesus or the teachings of Jesus. Okay, that's it. Not talking about the letters of Paul. It's not talking about uh, the, the other general epistles. It's not talking about Hebrews. It's not talking about Revelation. None of those things. It's talking about the gospel message of the you know who Jesus is or the teachings of Jesus or the prophetic word that's what's being taught being uh, talked about when it says the word James is going to actually use a bunch of different phrases here to talk uh, to he's talking to Jewish people who have come to accept Jesus as their messiah right and so he's going to use some words that he, that kind of normally they would allude to um, from the Hebrew scriptures and the Hebrew story and and kind of use that and replace that with the gospel message. And that's uh, highly agreed upon uh, with biblical scholars. Okay, so um, let's jump in verse 19. And here's the deal. Verse um, 19 is usually used in a very different way than we're going to see it actually in its context. It's actually used, um, I've, I've seen it used in counseling situations. I've seen it used in relational situations. But I want us to use it in its actual context when it talks about 
the message of Christ or of the gospel story that's implanted in you. Look what it says here. It says, you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Now, normally we'd be like, oh, well, of course, duh. But he's going to use this when talking about the gospel message or the message of Jesus. Look what it says here. It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all sortiness and rank growth of wickedness. I love that wording in the NRSV. Um, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. And so um, I, I think thinking what he's talking about here is when we, when we approach the message of Jesus, when we approach the, the teachings of Jesus, we should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry we should we should not become defensive when the mess the gospel message of jesus when it comes right up against us when the teachings of jesus hit us um, we should not our first response should not be to try to speak or to become angry about what it's doing we should allow it to confront us we should be quick to listen and then to do what it says it says for the for your anger doesn't produce God's righteousness. What does? The message of Jesus produces God's righteousness in you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sortiness, rain, growth, weakness. Welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. So when we come face to face with um, Jesus' teachings... We should not just listen to them and go, that was great. Oh, the wisdom was so good. And then walk away and do nothing with it. Jesus' teachings are meant to be lived. They're meant to be acted out. That's what that's what Jesus told us. He said, uh, but any of these who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like someone who is wise, right? But people who hear these words of mine and don't put them into practice, they are foolish because they're not living the way that uh, God wants them to live. And so James is kind of doubling down here. Remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. And so he's watched his brother grow up. He didn't believe in him at first. After the resurrection, he comes face-to-face -face with the truth of who Jesus is. And so he's like, I believe. Now he is a leader of the Jerusalem church. And he's just echoing the teachings of Jesus, his half-brother, when he says this. He says, be doers of the word, Don't, not just hearers only. Because those who just are mainly hearers, they're deceiving themselves. They're gaslighting themselves with Jesus' teachings. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in a mirror. They look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, the, per, the law, the law of liberty, James is using these phrases here that are very common in Judaism, but he's kind of flipping the meaning and saying, no, the perfect law is the law that Jesus gave us, the teachings of Jesus that he told us, right? And they persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act. They will be blessed in their hearing. No, they're going to be blessed in their doing blessed than they're doing. It's not enough to just hear the message of Jesus. It's not enough to just read about the message of Jesus. It's a call to action. Jesus calls us to action. It's a call to live it out. And not just the parts we like either. So it's to look at the whole thing and go, well, Jesus, you, you, I love the like, you know, love people thing, but I'm not sure about the like, go sell all my possessions to the poor and be about the oppressed and the needy and all that. I don't know about that. Like, I was more about the, you know, power for this and power for that. And it's like, no, no, there's Jesus's teachings are combative and confrontive to our, our culture sometimes and combative and confront, confrontive to who we are as selfish individuals sometimes. And Jesus's call is always to be self-sacrificing and not always wanting what I want, but what's the best of somebody else. And so they're going to confront us in ways like a mirror confronts us of how we look when we wake up in the morning. And the question is, are we going to do something about it or not? Right? If any think they are, look at what he, this is why I'm talking about it this way, because James talks about it this way in these next few verses. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues. So we need to be careful of the things coming out of our mouth, especially online. Right? But deceive their hearts. Their religion is worthless. Religion that's pure 
and undefiled before God the Father is this, to be a doer of the word. And so this is what he's going to say, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by, by the world. To, to be um, someone who is, uh, wants what God wants first and foremost. Um, and to, to, to work on our, our own personal piety is what James is saying here. Um, so the most important things, though, are like, okay, Jesus' message is not just like, a, oh, that's good to know kind of a thing. And James is saying, no, Jesus' message is meant to be done. Um, and so what we need to do when we're confronted with the message of Jesus and with, with who Jesus is, what we're supposed to do is we're not supposed to speak first. We're not supposed to come at it. And, we're not supposed to get angry, be defensive about it and try to defend our own position. We're just supposed to look at it like a mirror and go, all right, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do and who I'm supposed to be if I'm really a follower of Jesus. And if this is really what it's about. And Jesus confronted the religious people of their day who did exactly the opposite of that, who who knew all the right things. They went deep in the text, but they didn't do the things that they were preaching and saying. And Jesus called them hypocrites. Not because they didn't know the right stuff, it was because they didn't do the right stuff. And they cared about, in his opinion, the things that were the smaller parts of it, which were like knowing all the right laws and regulations and not doing the weightier things like justice and uh, and and caring for the oppressed and all those kind of people. And, and Jesus got on them over and over and over again about knowing the right stuff, but not doing the right stuff. And so I think that's something that, you know, we are, especially with those of us who live in uh, the United States and call ourselves Christians, especially evangelical Christians, we are guilty of this over and over and over again of saying that we know the right stuff, but man, we don't do the right stuff. And so we probably need to relook at that mirror again and, and be quiet don't get defensive. Don't try to fight and argue for your own position, but really look at it and say, okay, what's Jesus telling me? What's Jesus confronting me with? I need to be quick to listen and to welcome with meekness the word that's been implanted in us, the word of Jesus. That's what James is trying to get at here at the end of chapter one, to go out and actually do something with what you're confronted with not just listen to it go, that was great. I gained more wisdom. That's awesome. That's the end of James chapter one. He's going to run into James chapter two and give practical illustrations of how to do that. Well, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, like the video, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.